and thanks for joining. My name is Nigel Sizer. I'm the Chief Program Officer at Rainforest Alliance, talking to you here from New York City. Uh, Rainforest Alliance works to protect biodiversity, conserve forests, and improve the lives of people in thousands of farm and forest communities around the world. Most of our staff are working on the ground in tropical regions, for example, with cocoa farmers in West Africa, addressing child labor and deforestation, coffee farmers in the rainforests of Central and South America, forest guardians across the Congo region, the Amazon, Borneo, and Paten, who are dedicated stewards of tropical forests and benefit from sustainable enterprises. We work with them to establish and connect with international consumers committed to responsible purchases. The vision our 400 staff passionately share is of a world where people and nature thrive in harmony. We are part of nature and nature is part of us, but it has taken a microscopic particle visible only with the most powerful electron microscope, a type of coronavirus, which causes COVID-19 to remind us all of the most, in the most extraordinary way imaginable of how we are indeed part of nature. The pandemic has exposed our broken relationship with the rest of nature. And today we will explore the links between rainforests, biodiversity and pandemics, and most importantly, discuss how we can work together across the world toward a shared vision of planetary health. This is the first of what we hope will be several of these Instagram live events, and we hope you can join us for the next ones as well. I also want to take a moment to highlight that the pandemic is deeply hurting the thousands of forest and farm communities we, we work with around the world. They are the essential workers who produce the things we consume every single day. They continue to work despite the personal risk and they are also the world's forest guardians. Many can no longer sell their produce and are now suffering severe financial hardship. And most live in countries where public health services are very lacking indeed. These frontline rural communities are among the most exposed to this crisis and we need them to be doing well. As such, Rainforest Alliance has launched a global campaign to raise money for those hardest hit in the countries where we work. And you can donate to this through a link on the Instagram feed and also on our website. Just Google Rainforest Alliance and COVID-19 pandemic and it will be the first link that you see. Today, I am really delighted to discuss all of this with Dr. Mary Pearl. Mary is a zoologist, environmentalist and an educator who serves as the Dean of the Macaulay Honors College, which is part of the amazing City University of New York. Among several other roles, she also served as president for 50 years of EcoHealth Alliance, a global nonprofit organization dedicated to innovative conservation science. Newsweek magazine described Dr. Pearl as a leading biologist who has spearheaded the development of conservation medicine a scientific exploration of the links between the health of humans, wildlife, and ecosystems. So we couldn't have anyone better today to discuss these challenges with us. Welcome, Mary, and thank you so much for taking the time. Sorry for the technological glitches, but we're up and running. Uh, for many years, you helped lead EcoHealth Alliance, working on the front lines of the science of human health emerging diseases and planetary science. So I'd like to ask you first to just explain to us those links, the links between the way we treat other species, rainforests, other ecosystems, and this pandemic. Great. So Mary, there we go. Go ahead, Mary, talk about okay. how <laughs> rainforests, ecosystems, and the pandemic are all connected. What's going on? Um, yes, I, I, I think uh, many people think somehow the pandemic is a big surprise and it's an accident and an act of God, but actually it was hugely predictable given the way we've been treating our environment. Uh, we have been uh, converting uh, forested lands to mosaic landscapes of urbanization and agriculture. We've been introducing our bodies and our livestock to uh, former forest areas where we force pathogens uh, to adapt to new hosts. Most of them die out, but some 
will uh, invade our bodies and the bodies of, of our livestock. Um, we also, by destroying forests, we reduce uh, biodiversity and healthy ecosystems are characterized by a great deal of species diversity. And when we lose that, what happens is that pathogens can, uh, can invade. We all know that intuitively from agriculture. When we have monocultures, the pests arrive uh, to be more destructive than if uh, it's a, a mixed forest. So the other thing we do is um, we take animals out of uh, the forest and um, we bring them into markets where if they are kept alive um, alongside other species, it might be a, a civet cat or a pangolin adjacent to some chickens. Well, if a butcher is going to be chopping on the same chopping block, um, meat from all the from wildlife and livestock together. Again, pathogens uh, will move. Um, we've, uh, you know, I, I, I could go on and on in, in terms of toxicants and uh, endocrine disruptors, which we introduce into forests. Uh, we um, also uh, create damage that comes back to bite us. So those are the many of the ways that they're interrelated. Thanks, Mary. Tell us how you got into this. I mean, you were decades before the rest of the world started paying attention to this. What's your story? How did you? Um, this many well, years? zoologists um, tend to be out in remote areas. And um, I was at the uh, uh, Wildlife Conservation Society. It was called the New York Zoological Society then. Um, I had a researcher in West Africa um, present with a mysterious uh, uh, illness that uh, no one could diagnose. And um, being a zoologist and not a physician, <laughs> my first thought was, oh my goodness, I wonder where he caught it and whether wildlife, uh, the animals where he was working could have created this. And then I had a second thought, which was, um, we don't look at wildlife disease as a driver of populations. We look at it as just noise. And of course, that's not true with human populations. We have physicians and we also have public health scientists who look at the diseases that move through populations. And I thought we, we really need to not only look at wildlife disease populations as zoologists, um, but we also need to start talking to um, physicians and public health officials. So back in 1999, um, together with colleagues at Tufts uh, Veterinary School and the Harvard Medical School, uh, we organized one of the first meetings to create something we called conservation medicine, which, which we called a, uh, a crisis discipline, uh, that we really had to look at um, what the links were among health, among wildlife, livestock, and humans. And uh, so we were off and running, and um, I, I, I could go on, uh, but, but I just would say that uh, almost as immediately as we started looking, we saw um, uh, diseases that uh, were moving um, from animals to people. So uh, we had, uh, you know, the Nipah virus uh, in, in Southeast Asia. Um, people have heard now that SARS in 2004. Um, these are, um, these are diseases that, that keep recurring. And for years, um, uh, scientists have recommended um, a whole um, panoply of activities for prevention that, that could have been going on. So scientists have been talking about the risk of this kind of pandemic for decades, in fact. That's right. Were you surprised by COVID-19? Were you surprised by the lack of preparedness of so governments, including our own, to address this, not only here though, but all over the world, it seems. Governments simply were not expecting, were not ready for this in any way. Yes, I, I think, I mean, I was, um, I was not surprised. I was, of course, dismayed. But um, I remember six months before the SARS virus emerged in, in 2003 or 2004, we held a press conference in New York. No reporters came. We were talking about how there was viral chatter and coronaviruses uh, seemed to be on the move and that we could expect at some point um, a virus with pandemic potential um, emerging. Um, I think the problem is that um, uh, politicians uh, tip and policymakers like to present on the one hand a problem and on the other hand the solution for it. 
And um, these tend to be solutions after something happens. Um, the news always covers stories after something dramatic has happened, not the potential that something could happen. And I, I think it just um, perhaps a, a, a failure of the imagination. One of the things that I can't understand, and I'd invite people listening to ask themselves, how is it that when we were told and shown what was happening in Wuhan, when we were told and shown what was happening in, in Italy, you still couldn't get, people just didn't think it was gonna to happen to them. I, I don't know what it is about human nature, but people were still out and about going to clubs and parties and crowded stores. And uh, even having seen what was going on to human beings in other urban settings, it's, it's um, I hate to say it, it it's human nature, but um, uh, the, the, it's, these issues seem to go off the boil. I mean, we had SARS and then uh, we, we just ignored it. Uh, we tolerate um, a great uh, a disease that's uh, very common in the United States, uh, which is also an environmental disease, by the way, of, of, of forest fragmentation, Lyme disease. Um, it's, it's highly prevalent and, and we just tolerate it uh, rather than taking the steps perhaps to uh, make our landscapes less conducive to its spread. And it's only a few years ago that we were terrified that Ebola was going to spread to the United States, right? Or President Obama had a had a whole team working on this and led a global effort to help African kind of address that. And I think one case made its way here to, to New York, was it, or to the US. Um, yes. So it's only a few years ago that we saw how incredibly dangerous these types of emerging diseases can be. Uh, yes. I think it is remarkable that more action wasn't taken. Let's, let's talk about a little bit more about the environmental side of this. I'm sure most of the people listening have heard about the wildlife trade connections with this coronavirus. Apparently it emerges from a horseshoe bat species. Uh, it's found uh, occurring in populations of horseshoe bats in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and there have been calls to shut down the wildlife trade and so on. So you could co comment a little bit on that. Uh, we've heard a lot about that over the last weeks. I'm interested in hearing a little bit more though from you about how deforestation and colonization, people moving into frontier forest areas and other natural habitats is also part of, of the risk of future pandemics. Uh, sure, there's an example uh, we can look at uh, that took place um, in the late 90s. Uh, a uh, virus uh, uh, mysteriously appeared in Malaysia. Uh, pigs got it first and they started coughing and it was called one mile cough because their coughs were so loud. Um, and um, they didn't mostly get sick. They just got a bad cough and they got better, but all the piglets were dying. Um, and uh, what happened, again, human nature, people had these sick pigs, they started selling them to, you know, to preserve what income they could. So these pigs spread all over the, the country. Um, and how did it emerge? Well, the pig farms um, were a pretty new development. Uh, Malaysians, for the most part, are Muslims and don't eat pigs, but in Singapore, they do. So a, uh, a farms were created. They, they were sort of carved into what had been rainforests. And what happened is uh, farmers would build these um, open-air pig sties with, with roofs over them, uh, rafters. And the bats that were wild bats, fruit bats that were accustomed to living in trees, started roosting in, um, you know, uh, underneath the, the, the roof, but over the pigs. And the farmers conveniently, as, as most uh, mixed farm strategies have, papaya trees and fruit trees. So the bats were happy, you know, eat the fruit, go, you know, hang out in the rafters. And of course, bats to fly, they, they, uh, they spit out, you know, the, the less nutritious parts of anything they eat. They, they defecate a great deal, so they, they're lightweight to fly. So the pigs, again, were eating up little fruit bits and other uh, detritus from the bats. Um, and that's how the disease moved. It was a disease of incursions, uh, incursion into wild lands. And um, the Nipah virus is very serious, a 40 to 75% uh, fatality, depending where it is. In Malaysia, where the, the healthcare is very good, is more towards 40%. Uh, because the pig handler, I forgot the link, the pig handlers got it. 
Now in Malaysia, it didn't seem to go human to human, but when it emerged in 2001 in Bangladesh, uh, the original um, human uh, sick people got it from, um, from a palm, a date palm nectar that they collected from uh, date palms where uh, bats had come in to roost. And uh, then they got it, but unfortunately, uh, it started going human to human, but not by air droplets. The, um, so we're very lucky that Ebola, for example, did not spread with a contagion of COVID-19. But we can expect, and I, I'm sorry, I don't want to be scary, but it is um, perhaps inevitable that a disease that is, say, as contagious as measles um, and as lethal as Ebola, it could happen. Um, this, is, uh, this is in the realm of possibility, and that's why it's so urgent for us to get smart about uh, managing our planet. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Yeah, we don't want to be scary here, but the next pandemic could already be emerging somewhere, right? Somewhere on a, on a frontier or in a wildlife market, there could be transmission of viruses, bacteria, protozoans, other disease-causing organisms from wildlife to humans. As people are clearing more and more forests, small fragments of forest are left behind. The wildlife is concentrated in those fragments and the people who live around it have more and more contact with that wildlife, increasing the chance of some, just, and it just takes one in many cases, right? One random interaction between a human and another species for that potential pathogen to spill over into our species and begin the next episode. Well, I'd like to say a few reassuring things. Uh, it, it's, um, there, there are many, I mean, there are uh, nearly two million viruses that haven't been described. I mean, we most of them don't do anything to us, um, and most spillovers are don't matter. We, we're asymptomatic. I mean, your dog or cat will have diseases that you can't possibly get because the virus or the bacterium or the parasite is adapted to one species or not another. It's kind, it's relatively rare for these to spill over. The other thing is we need to think of this from the virus's perspective, because uh, some people have called this a war, and it is kind of a war, but we don't think about the strategy of our opponent. <laughs> and viruses do not want to kill their hosts. Um, so um, oftentimes we will see a virus um, becoming less lethal because it's in their interest to have their, uh, the, 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 the person that they're in survive to, uh, to share it with another human being. So they don't wanna kill off their host. So oftentimes viruses will uh, simply, well, they're constantly mutating and so are bacteria. And they can, uh, they, they, they can become less, um, less uh, fatal um, as, as time goes on. Um, and of course, one of the things we have now that we haven't had in the past is uh, there was a program called PREDICT that was funded by USA for the last 10 years. And uh, around 30 labs around the, around the world were set up for surveillance for pathogens, for pathogen discovery, um, syndrome surveillance. These are all things that were going on so that I, I think it's pretty remarkable that the virus was isolated so quickly, for example, and described so quickly so that uh, the, the work towards creating a vaccine is, is moving very quickly. It, it, it's, it takes a while because you have to but, but they're already in trials to see, you know, how, how these will work. So um, we, we have, um, we know our enemy better than we used to. And uh, so I think we'll be, be better off. But um, when you think of the cost benefit of how to really save the health of the most people, um, it's really forest conservation, environmental conservation, not going in and eating wildlife. Um, and um, that's, that's really the most cost-effective uh, um, public health benefit. Because I've, we haven't even talked about how important forests are for um, not just mental well-being. We all know after a walk in the forest, like yesterday was Sunday, I went for a walk in the forest and saw warblers. I felt like a million bucks, you know. But also physiologically, it's been documented that people who spend time in forests have, um, have a better immunity, immune systems, uh, and are less prone to depression. <laughs> so there's, th these are physiological uh, differences that, that we can appreciate as well. It's not just our, 
our, our health against viruses and bacteria. Thank you, Mary. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the social aspects of this, right? So we've heard all about a little bit about the wildlife trade, about how protecting forests and better taking care of the ecosystems around us can help reduce the risk of future pandemics. Uh, what about the social justice aspects of this? It's on the news here every day, the janitors, the nurses, the medical technicians and so on who are risking their lives to, to, to protect people in the hospitals and so on. But then we've got the fruit pickers, the farm workers, the, the coffee pickers and so on that we work with all over the world. They're also now having to risk their lives coming into contact with each other to keep those supply chains running, partly because of the, the demand and the need to do that, but also just so they can continue to have an income. Many of them are very, very poor people who do not have uh, other options. Um, what, what are your thoughts on the, on the social side of this? Um, well, I, I think um, that the uh, COVID-19 has uncovered um, the inequalities of healthcare in that we're seeing populations with uh, less access to healthcare um, coming, uh, approaching uh, COVID-19 with pre-existing conditions uh, for several reasons. We haven't even talked about the environmental justice of placement of factories and coal plants and so forth. Often the populations live adjacent to these uh, truck routes and uh, you know, sources of uh, environmental pollution. Um, they tend to be um, low-income people and then they um, are more prone to have asthma. And of course, we know asthma is one of the um, pre-existing conditions that, uh, that, that creates a poor prognosis for COVID-19. So it kind of uncovers the inequalities of environmental conservation. So they have multiple assaults, the virus on top of the, uh, the toxicants in their lives. Um, we also have, yes, as you said, people who uh, continue to work to, to have income um, and I, I think it's really interesting. I think a permanent change in our lives might be redefining what essential work is, as we realize the kind of people that the work that's done that, that we need to, to survive. And it's really incumbent upon us to have the best possible health care for all people because the health care for the poorest among us um, affects the health of all of us. It's in our self-interest. We don't even have to be uh, Mother Teresa to want good health care for all. That's great, Mary. Thank you. Just for those, anyone who's joined us, we're partway through. I'm Nigel Sizer with Rainforest Alliance, and I'm talking here uh, with Mary Pearl about the pandemic, about rainforests, about social justice, um, and about how we can prevent these kinds of pandemics or help to prevent them in the future. Uh, let's, let's start looking forward here. And I, I just also should mention that listeners can type questions into the Zoom question and answer box or uh, put them on Instagram Live and we'll be collecting some of those for discussion in a few minutes. So please go ahead and add your questions if you would like to. Mary, let's talk about the concept of, of planetary health. Another term I've heard is, is one health. Just talk about what those are and what those mean and why they're so relevant here. Um, well, one, we, I think as, as human beings, um, in our society, we tend to think that we are unique, but we're really a member of the order primates, right along with the apes and monkeys. Um, and um, there is one health. It's planetary health means that our health is linked to the health of all other uh, beings. And it's also linked to the health of ecosystems. And ecosystems are healthy if they're diverse and if they're resilient. Um, and uh, we, uh, we eat away at the diversity and resilience of ecosystems. Thanks everyone for being with us. This is Nigel Seid with Rainforest Alliance talking uh, with Mary, who is an expert on planetary health, one health and the links between this pandemic and how we treat nature. Um, Mary, uh, policy makers, decision makers all over the world, this is their list right now. Nothing is more important than this. What's your message to them? What do we need to do differently going forward? And you can have more than one thing if you want. I think there's more oh, sure. a bit of a list if necessary. Go ahead. Well, 
You know, um, there's an organization uh, that meets uh, every other year called the International One Health uh, Congress. They met in, in uh, Canada in t two years ago, 2018, and they discussed what they called peacetime preparedness, ironically. Now we're at war, but they, uh, they basically said we have to have syndrome surveillance um, in humans and animals. An example of this is I mentioned the Nipah virus in Malaysia, how deadly it was. The reason it was found in Bangladesh is that um, the teropid bats, the fruit bats that spread the disease, um, we looked at the range of these bats and saw, oh my goodness, look at all the places they are, and started a discovery, an investigation by, uh, to see how many uh, disease syndromes were described in local newspapers or by public health uh, offices where they had no explanation. And that's actually how the disease was identified in Bangladesh because it was, um, there were these outbreaks that were unexplainable. And so the explanation could happen. So that's syndrome surveillance. Pathogen discovery, um, looking for diseases in uh, bats, in fleas, in rodents, um, in uh, mosquitoes, um, various parasites. I think sometimes some people might think, oh, bats are terrible. We just have to get rid of the bats and everything will be great. Well, um, bats are more, no more likely to harbor pathogens than any other species. It's just there's so many of them. Same with rodents. You know? so, so they're so abundant and so plentiful, there is this spillover. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be watching them very closely and monitoring um, for uh, the viral chatter of disease, of that viruses that seem to be on the move. Um, we also have to have uh, diagnostic development for uh, the major um, viruses and bacteria that are causing or disease causing, and platforms for distribution of, of these um, diagnostics. This is, this is one of the places we really fell down. We still don't know um, the prevalence of, uh, of COVID-19. That is outrageously stupid of us as a, as a species. Um, we also have to have a, uh, uh, a, a better prediction of um, pathogenesis, when a virus might move from innocent uh, traveler to, um, to disease vector. Um, we have to uh, really uh, have preventive intervention platforms. We have to, I mean, a lot of people say, let's just close down the wet markets. It's not as simple as that. A people's eating habits die hard. And um, so it's a very complex combination of education and because uh, you, you can't just force these things underground because that's what would happen and that would be even more dangerous. So, so you were just talking about the wet markets and the, the animal trade, of course. Yes, Go ahead. I've been to an animal, wet animal market and, and uh, you know, was hustled out. This was, this was back in uh, the early 2000s. Um, so, you know, they officially were uh, closed after SARS and they crept back. Um, so it really speaks to a massive education uh, campaign. Um, we uh, really, by and large, I mean, people should not think it's exciting to eat something exotic. And I know people do, you know, and um, people should uh, really understand that um, if they uh, see, a, say, a dead animal, they really shouldn't touch it. I mean, we still have plague in the southwest of, of this country, so you wouldn't want to uh, touch a, a dead rodent or breathe in the aerosol in an old cabin where you see dead mice. Um, so we need to uh, find ways to cut the links between uh, disease, uh, diseases in uh, species that can move to, to humans. Um, what else? So that's communication strategies, a therapeutic discovery. Um, there are so many uh, things that uh, governments can do, it really has been a lack of political will, not a lack of knowledge of what could happen because uh, scientists have known this, as, as I've explained since the outset of this conversation, for decades. And we have, I mean, since the, the I mean, I thought the bubonic plague might have been the earliest um, uh, pandemic uh, came uh, via, from, from rodents, via fleas, a bacterium causing it. But there was actually one in the sixth century um, AD, uh, a bubonic plague outbreak um, in the Middle East. So uh, this has been with us a very long time and um, 
thousands of years, thousands yes. of years. And this, and this right. particular, I mean, ex exactly a pandemic like this with exactly this kind of virus even has been predicted by the scientists who, who work on this. Yes. Um, and very little resources has been given to that work. I, I saw, you mentioned earlier, the PREDICT program that I think USAID was supporting <laughs> around the world. I know that the funding for that was, was cut in recent years. I it was canceled. The, it was canceled in it was September. Canceled. Three months canceled. before COVID nineteen before. emerged. Yes, but now it's been extended, right. and um, you know we'll, we'll be. Um, you know, uh, the, I forget the barn door and the horses and the fire uh, analogy, <laughs> but the, that you know we. Um, it, but the good news is that um, it's you're never too late to the present moment. <laughs> And um, yeah. at the present moment, we can summon the political will to set up uh, the infrastructure, one, to protect our health, and two, well, to protect our health from pandemics and spillovers. And so, so just wrapping up here, folks, and sorry again for, for dropping off a little bit with the sound, but we're back again. Uh, as Mary has stressed, this, this was predicted. Uh, more resources are needed for prevention. This is now top of the priority list for policymakers around the world. And so I think we can be optimistic that we will see much more attention being given is to issues like the illegal wildlife trade, the need to protect tropical rainforests and other natural ecosystems, and the need to support and work more with the communities who live in those in and around those forests who for, for millennia have been, in some cases, have been guardians of those forests who work to protect the biodiversity and who now are also helping to protect us from future future pandemics by preserving that amazing natural ecosystem. Uh, so Mary, we've got some various questions coming in here. I just want to, uh, let's just see what we've got here. Um, let's talk about, here's a good one. So this ties into Rainforest Alliance's work directly. What do you think about the tangible steps, about things that People listening to this presentation should be doing what can what can we all be doing to help uh, prevent future pandemics? What can um, consumers be doing? What can what can members of environmental groups be doing, and so on? Well, of course, supporting forest conservation is very important. Um, it's also uh, it's important. It matters that you you stay home and that you follow the guidance of, of public health uh, officials. Um, it's, um, uh, I think uh, we need to um, uh, really lobby our, our um, policy makers uh, to ensure that um, we have healthcare that is uh, available. I mean, all the, everything, the political will suddenly appeared for everyone to have medical insurance, for people to be treated for COVID-19 if they presented at a hospital. Why should it stop at that? Um, I think, uh, I believe that, uh, health is a right um, and that our citizens uh, should enjoy equal access to, to good health care. <laughs> that's, that's just number one um, that I, I think is important. Um, and uh, second, we, we need to ask our, our policymakers to uh, really um, uh, make sure that the, that the government um, uh, has strong uh, policies of uh, surveillance um, it, there would be nothing wrong with having every protected area have a public health scientist monitoring wildlife for, for health. Um, and uh, we've talked about how animals are sources of diseases, but they're also recipients of diseases. I mean, we, we can see, for example, people who bring their dogs to the beach and let them defecate on the beach and don't clean up after them. They can be endangering the, uh, the health and lives of seals and sea lions. Um, this has actually happened. There was a um, an outbreak of influenza in Denmark um, that uh, the disease then went to the harbor seals and was devastating to them, but they went through a bottleneck, they survived, uh, sort of the, the herd immunity. And interestingly, the disease went then back to humans uh, from the seals later, sort of poetic justice. But uh, it's an example about how our, our health is all connected. So people should really think, think when they go into the forest for walks, uh, don't pick things up, don't leave things behind. Have, have respect um, for, for nature and, and nature will treat us right. I mean, and that's something else that I think one of the enchanting parts of the, the emails I'm getting and is uh, 
how uh, pictures of wildlife uh, coming back, dolphins frolicking in Venetian canals and, uh, and sheep wandering in uh, British villages. Um, if you give nature half a chance, uh, it, it comes back. It's really true. And so forest protection, ecosystem protection, building corridors between ecosystem fragments so you can have that kind of resilience that uh, it goes away when uh, ecosystems are, are disruptive. This is, these are all health measures, actually. And we're actually seeing some of that with the social distancing that's happening. People, I was just talking to colleagues this morning and everyone was commenting on how much more wildlife they're seeing, more birds, more nature around them. I had a pair of foxes walking through my yard this morning to get, uh, getting ready for the mating season. It was the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful things I've seen for a long time. Uh, and reminded me of, of how much we, we treasure nature and how much we are connected to it. Um, one of the questions that's coming in quite a bit here is, is about science and policy. You've held many senior positions. Uh, what do we, what can we, what can we do fundamentally to ensure that politicians listen more to scientists? Was it, was it unrealistic to think that they would politicians would have heard scientists warning about this pandemic? Well, as I said, one of my experiences in talking to politicians is they don't want you to present them with problems without solutions. Politicians never like to say, this is a disaster and I don't know what to do about it. So you have to come in with uh, um, the, the problem that gets strong enough to get their attention and then, and then the, the solution. So um, that's why it's so important to have sort of a positive uh, way of saying, and if you do this, this will be really wonderful for people. Um, I fear we have a strong sort of anti-intellectual streak in our society. So, so Mary, you were just saying about policymakers like scientists to come with the solution, not with the problem. Well, on climate change, I feel like we've been doing that for at least 25, 30 years, mm -hmm. uh, and there's still major at least major pockets of resistance to that. And even in some of the most progressive parts of the world, I think many would say politicians are still not doing enough to address climate change. And the science there is so overwhelming. I think one of the problems is that um, more economists uh, become politicians than um, wildlife biologists or ecologists. I think we have to have <laughs> more scientists, really, because the, I, I hate here seeing articles about the, that, that, that it's either nature or jobs. That, that's just yeah. a, a false uh, um, a tra um, contrast. Um, we need to have, uh, we need to live in uh, ecosystems that are healthy because that is the source of all prosperity and health ultimately. And uh, so I think uh, if we have more politicians who are, and it, it speaks to their lack of training in science. I mean, we have, I, I remember hearing a, a, a politician, a, a physicist, um, who is a congressman from New Jersey, um, and when the anthrax scare came out, um, there were um, a lot of his colleagues who read complex treatises on political theory and economic theory were asking him, tell me about anthrax. And he said, well, I'm a physicist, but at least I have, a, a, I understand the scientific way of knowing something and I can read an article. They could have read the article. So I think we have uh, a lot of educating of, um, of politicians uh, so that they understand they're not afraid of science. They don't have to run away from it. It's actually a source of great ideas for policy. And um, that's, uh, I think it behooves uh, scientists um, to, uh, to talk to uh, politicians. Um, I think also politicians like certainty and scientists provide ambiguity. We can't promise that something won't happen. We can't, I mean, scientists deal with probabilities and risk. Uh, and as long as uh, we can have a common language, I think that's important. That's great. So any scientists who are listening, run for office, please. We need you more than ever. <laughs> and we will need you more than ever after this. There's some other comments coming in. I'll, I'll maybe say a little bit about this. Uh, questions about how do we restore forest landscapes the role of local communities in pre preventing deforestation. This really gets to the heart of a lot of the work that Rainforest Alliance is doing around the world with hundreds of staff, 
from the Amazon to the forests of Central and West Africa to Borneo, Sumatra, Papua, working our work in India with tea farmers, with, with uh, banana producers across South America. And what we see is that the best way to protect what's left of natural ecosystems is working with the local communities who depend upon those resources, who live in those landscapes and cherish them. Their livelihoods depend upon stewarding that nature well. And often they're the best place, therefore, to also lead efforts to restore that nature. And we're seeing more and more community-led efforts to do that. Governments are supporting this work. Uh, some companies are as well. Many, many nonprofits, NGOs around the world are involved in this kind of work. And I'm hopeful that because of a greater understanding that this pandemic is bringing about the relationship between people and nature and the need to care for nature, we will see more support for that kind of work. We will see consumers, every one of you, when you go shopping, when you're buying cocoa, coffee, bananas, products that are coming from tropical regions, that you are looking at the labels on those products, you're making sure that they've been produced in a responsible way, that children weren't exploited as, as child labor, that rainforest wasn't cleared for their production. There are all sorts of programs, including the Rainforest Alliance Certification Program, which help to address that. Many companies have worked with us for, for many, many years on this, but many other companies need to do much, much more. And the more everyone can do to be reminding them of that, the better we'll all be. Uh, let's see, where are we here? Mary, I think we need to start wrapping up in a few minutes. I'm getting a lot of feedback here as well. Go ahead and Go ahead and just share with us some final thoughts, comments, advice as we go forward here. One of the things that um, I just noticed in the questions and the feeds was someone was asking about the link between animal agriculture and deforestation. Of course, there is yes. a major link, eat less meat. Um, the other thing is that um, one of the diseases uh, that we're, we're seeing are antibiotic resistant diseases, and that is because of the abuse of antibiotics. Most people don't realize that most of the antibiotics used in the United States um, are um, actually on wildlife, on, on not wildlife, I mean on livestock, in, in uh, chicken growing places and, and, and pig farms. And, and it's, it's devastating because first of all, that the workers there will get the antibiotic resistance. Sometimes um, the, by the time an antibiotic is uh, approved for human use, it already is ineffective because of these industrial um, uh, meat farms have, um, have, have created it in, the animals have, have built the resistance against uh, um, the effects of, of the antibiotic. So don't eat, don't eat so much meat. And uh, even if you just reduced it to once a week, it would, it would really change um, how uh, uh, we protect uh, forests and protect our health. Thank you, Mary. Uh, we've lost the sound again, but hopefully they can hear me. And I'll just say what you just said, and we're going to start to wrap up anyway. Uh, okay, could you also I tell them, to... so someone said, why doesn't she use her laptop? Well, I did use my laptop for the Zoom. I had to have the phone for the Instagram. Yeah, yeah we can figure that... it out in the future. Yeah, <laughs> we're apolo Mary's apologizing for the technical issues here. Uh, we've got phones and laptops and everything all going at once to be on Zoom and Instagram Live. I'm glad you can hear me. We're going to wrap up now. Mary's just saying, commenting on animal agriculture and, and made a very important statement, a very simple statement eat less meat, just eat less meat. If you have to eat meat, try and make it once a week uh, or even less. If you wanna protect rainforests, if you wanna address climate change, one of the most significant steps you can take is to eat less meat, especially red meat. Animal agriculture has very serious impacts on the environment, on our health, as well as of course, the cruelty to the animals involved. Uh, the other key points that we've addressed and discussed on this conversation are the fact that this pandemic was predicted by many scientists going back many decades. In fact, exactly this type of pandemic with exactly this type of virus, the coronavirus that causes flu-like symptoms and respiratory distress has been predicted for decades. It's time for policymakers to start listening to what the scientists are saying on these issues, on climate change, on renewable energy, 
on water pollution, air pollution, and a whole number of other issues. Uh, we've heard that planetary health is a key concept and the one health concept. These are closely related ideas about how human health and the health of the planet and the health of the species and ecosystems around us are very, very closely connected. And Mary said so clearly, so strongly, just go outside if you can and have a walk around in the forest and you'll immediately feel better. And the research shows that your immunity will be improved by doing that. So our health is connected with the ecosystems around us. We need to take better care of those ecosystems. And here at Rainforest Alliance, we're committed to working with thousands of forests and farm communities around the world to help them protect the forests and ecosystems where they live to produce sustainable food that we can all benefit from and enjoy. We appreciate their efforts, the risks that they are taking to support us with those supply chains. Uh, we hope that you can also support them as well. Again, if you want to contribute to our emergency fund, which is provide support to key communities and people on the ground around the world where we're working, you can find that on our website and on our Instagram link. So, so with that, I thank everybody for joining us. Thank you again, Mary. It's so good to see you all and look out for more Instagram, Zoom events like this in the future. And goodbye. Have a great day, everybody.